to, it went to everybody in the room. But you can't, you know, it's, it, it, I don't, I know people could, blacks could feel, what is, I'm not a racist. That's what's so insane about this. I don't, and yet, it's said, it comes through, it fires out of me. And uh, even now in the, in, in the, in the passion and the, and the, uh, that's here as I, as I confront myself. The results of Mazrin's research into the origins and effects of unconscious prejudice have been genuinely startling. And the moral and political implications of her research are very large indeed. Today, Mazrin brings her insights as a social psychologist to bear on the democratic practices and principles that form the great theme of this lecture series. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mazrin Banaji of the Yale Psychology Department. In New York or New Milford or New Haven, a skin darker than another is more likely to fetch a bullet and, if lucky, merely a permit to a lifetime of minor abuses. My own focus has been on the unconscious mental roots of such threats to the dignity of the individual. Uh, that is to say that their origin in thought and feeling are not always detected by the conscious mind. We are interested in them, for by their very nature, they fool the senses and consciousness, existing as they do in the heretofore unexamined parts of the mind. From the last two decades of work on the mental mechanics of unconscious prejudice, I conclude that the experimental evidence gives new meaning to the phrase eternal vigilance, for the facts and figures that have been accumulated show that the threats to democracy's ideals of fair and just treatment lie in every single mind. Um, this is one of my favorite illusions. I use it no matter what talk I give. So many of you have seen it. But the great thing about this uh, illusion is that even if you've seen it before, it will still uh, be an illusion. Uh, to, sh to, 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 make you, to make you be aware that this is not magic, we're going to do it with two physical transparencies. This is not magic. This is a real perceptual illusion. Um, the two tabletops in this, um, on this transparency are identical in surface shape and, and size. Okay? But that's not how they appear to you. Okay? And so what Kristen's going to do is show you by overlaying one that indeed these two tabletops are identical in shape and size. You want to, for the skeptics, do it one more time? Okay. All right. Okay. And the illusion um, has, as at, at, at its heart, this is an illusion developed by Roger Shepard, uh, a Yale PhD and both a talented artist and psychologist. Um, and, and what's at the heart of this is perspective, which is given by the legs that this table uh, stands on, uh, one of which is parallel to the line of vision, the other of which is perpendicular. Uh, the image of the two table surfaces on your retina uh, is indeed identical, but your mind overextends the one that is parallel, and that's the reason that the illusion appears. I use this illusion to often make the case that two people who come from two different social groups may perform exactly the same action, just as these two tables are identical, but our knowledge about what their social groups are may allow us not to see them as being similar. I'm going to give you one more demo in which you will participate, and then we'll talk about some of the data from our, our experiments. This is a very standard experiment, uh, standard procedure used in psychology experiments. It's called the Stroop task, and it's going to be quite easy for you to do this first part. Um, what you have to do is just ignore the word and tell us what the color of the word. It's either a brown or a green. How are we going to do this in, ro in rows, Kristen, going down top to bottom? Columns? OK. All right. So. Uh, she'll start you off, and when you see the top one, you'll just say what the color is, and then we'll move on to the next and the next, and so on, for about two, two columns, I'll say. Okay, so we'll start with brown. Okay, so let's say brown. <laughs> green. Red, 
let's stop. Let's stop. I think we got the point on that one. Now, let's change. Let's, let's, let's go to the next one. Now, what you're going to do again is ignore what the word is and simply name the color in which the word appears. Okay? So ignore the word. Simply name the color in which the word appears. So brown. It's It's a, it's a very simple demonstration, and it shows us that there are things that you might try to ignore, but try as you might, just as the meaning of the word comes through, disabling your ability to be able to name something as simple as the color of the object. Uh, so, we argue, do things about social objects enter into uh, our ways of thinking, even when there is an attempt to ignore them. Okay, so we use an idea that is similar to the Stroop task, except that it concerns social groups, male and female, old and young, Asian American, European American, and so on. And what we do is we do ask people about their conscious beliefs about these groups. Is this person or group American? Uh, how really American are they? Uh, is this person strong or weak? Is this person or group good or bad? And so on. But we also do something else and ask, besides asking them these questions. We make them respond under reasonable time pressure. This task would have been a lot easier had you been able to take a long while to tell us whether the color of each word was green or blue or red, thereby giving you enough time to overcome uh, the interference of the meaning of the word. Um, but when we put people under time pressure and make them make classifications rapidly, we can see effects about the ways in which uh, the unconscious works that are not otherwise available to us. And what I'm going to do is simply describe to you uh, a variety of experiments that we've done. We work with faces of these kinds. We tell subjects in our experiments. This, this experiment was done by Thierry Devos in my lab. And he shows people pictures like these, tells them that these are people born in the United States and the university that they're attending, and then looks to see um, in, in, an ex in experiments that we do where we look for fast classification of faces like these into categories along with symbols that represent either America or foreign. And we look to see how fast these pairings are made. Okay? And what we find when we look at both data for Asian Americans and African Americans is that in spite of what our subjects tell us about their conscious beliefs that African Americans are as American as European Americans, that in the reaction time data that our computers collect, that is not the case. People are able to very rapidly make the classification of white faces with American, and it takes them a lot longer to make the same association when it is black faces or Asian faces, and the difference in those bars captures that. The lower the bar, the faster the response. So the orange bar, which captures the data for white plus American, is faster than it is for either Asian plus American or African uh, American plus American. Um, let me see what we have next. We've done experiments looking at many different groups so that the results that we um, uh, re conclusions that we reach are not a function of a single group. This is research done by Will Cunningham, a graduate student at Yale currently, and we've looked at many different kinds of groups. We have people do these classifications about with faces that are faces of African Americans and Europeans. Uh, we have people make judgments about the rich and the poor, uh, whether they're foreign or American, and in this case, we're not looking for their association between these categories and American, as we were looking at before. Here, we're looking at the strength of the association between these concepts and something that is quite fundamental to how we look at the worth of a person. Is this person good or bad? Okay? And so the judgments that are being made in these experiments is to pair faces or words that capture these categories. Okay? with concepts like love and peace and joy and so on, okay? or negative things, words like hatred and war and anger and so on. So what we are seeing here, when I tell you that there is a 138 millisecond effect there, what that tells you is that, it is fat, it, that there's a facility in linking word, faces of European Americans in this case with words that mean things like, that, that, that are good, words like joy and peace and happy and so on. With black. And what you're seeing there then are kind of large effects, something like 83% of those who took that test showed that kind of preference for white equals good. Okay? 
Um, not 86 percent of those who took the test showed a preference for rich equals good, okay? Not surprising in that case, and I'll show you some of the conscious data that will tell you that, that even consciously, people are quite willing to say that rich is better than poor, but not so for the other categories, okay? Not so for foreign versus American, not so for Jewish versus Christian, not so for gay versus straight. On conscious measures of prejudice, uh, most of the reports are that, and I'll just show you the in fact, quite opposite order in which our conscious and unconscious beliefs lie. Okay? Our conscious beliefs tend to be pro-groups that we believe to be disadvantaged, but our implicit or unconscious beliefs tend to be quite the opposite. In this case, they go, they're in conflict in almost every case, the least in the case of rich-poor.